Mura Mutsi. <laughs> Did I get that right? Okay. Well, good morning, um, honored, honored guests. Uh, thank you so much for, for um, giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. And thank you also to our host, the Center of Excellence, along with the Universities of Oxford and Kansas for hosting us. Um, as Beth mentioned, I'm from the South African National Biodiversity Institute. And I'm gonna talk to you um, a little bit about how valuable biodiversity data can be for the sustainable development agenda using some examples from South Africa. Um, and we've been working quite closely with uh, the Center of Excellence along with the Ministry of Environment as both Marshall and, and Beth have mentioned. And it's been a really exciting journey. Um, yeah, and the main point I wanna make is the, this community of practice that we need to build as a continent, but hopefully that'll come out during the presentation. Uh, and as Beth mentioned, this is also part of a JRS funded project called African Biodiversity Challenge. And we're working on several other African countries to help establish biodiversity information systems um, and help with data mobilization. Okay, so why are we doing this? Um, I'm sure you can all feel the effects of our environmental breakdown. Um, yeah, so increasing carbon emissions, loss of ecosystems and um, natural habitat is leading to us outstripping our planetary boundaries and several key earth systems, which is not only sad for biodiversity, it's also directly impacting our economies. So this, uh, this destabilizing environment that we're living in is, is, is causing a loss of billions of dollars in economic damage through, through um, increased um, natural disasters, which include wildfires, floods, droughts, extreme weather, etc., etc. So this is really a problem, um, not just for biodiversity science, it's a problem for the world. Now the way most governments are trying to deal with this is through a generalized program called ecosystem-based adaptation, which is really using nature to help adapt to climate change, as well as uplift socioeconomic development and conserve biodiversity. So that's a really tall order to get right. And we need to make sure that we, that we have our systems um, in place. So, um, yeah, so Marshall warmed you up to the slide and really the point that I want to um, make here is that biodiversity data is a currency for sustainable development. It informs and helps um, measure um, almost all economic sectors in some way. Sorry, getting used to that. And the reason I say biodiversity data is a currency is both metaphorical and literal. So we all know the value of our ecosystem services can be immense. Um, for example, this is the latest intergov intergovernmental panel on biodiversity and ecosystem services assessment for Africa. And um, they estimated that the fisheries, the inland fishery value alone for East Africa is $1.2 billion per year. The value of natural vegetation for erosion control is estimated at $11,000 per square kilometer per year. So this is um, an incredible amount of money. And no wonder that um, private investors are increasingly supporting sustainable development enterprises and businesses. For example, um, a Nature Conservancy report um, in 2016 estimated that between 2004 and 2015, about $8.2 billion worth of private capital was invested into conservation businesses. Now the sad thing is, only 9% of this investment occurred in Africa. And one of the reasons, there are many reasons why that happened, but one of the reasons is that African countries generally have a lack of baseline biodiversity data in which to map patterns, and also a lack of monitoring systems in which to be able to measure the impact of those interventions and thus calculate the return on investment for investors. So this is really a lost um, revenue stream for, for developing countries. So what do we do about it? The first thing um, is make our biodiversity data openly accessible for decision makers. I'm sure you've all heard of the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. This is a global initiative um, established in 2004 to create a platform for making all biodiversity data sets freely accessible online. This is a map of the current density of um, GBIF records. And recently they passed the one billion record mark. Now these, any of these data sets, you can go onto the GBIF website and download for free. Um, now the problem is that while we've got in Africa, we're gradually building an African community of practice for um, data mobilization, 
our data publishing efforts are still quite low. So I'm not going to go through this graph, but the, the summary is besides South Africa, if you take South Africa out of the equation, the rest of African institutions themselves publish less than 1% of the global total on GBIF. So this is obviously a big problem if we're talking about sustainable development, we're talking about um, climate change, and we're talking about evidence-based decision making, as uh, the Permanent Secretary mentioned, we don't have the currency to be able to make those informed decisions. Okay, so what do we do about it? Um, we need to establish national biodiversity information facilities, as my colleague Marshall pointed out. And these are really central hubs that can collate data and serve them to the public. So in South Africa, SAMBI is that national biodiversity information facility, and our motto is to synthesize and serve. So we enter into data sharing agreements with institutions across the country. These range from museums to NGOs to universities to government departments. And we make these data sets accessible on our, on our biodiversity information system. To date, we've published about 25, over 25 million species records, and this has enabled a really um, great diversity of data being available to decision makers. We not only publish uh, species records, we also publish spatial layers. So this, this includes vegetation maps, ecosystem types, uh, data sets on natural habitat loss, degradation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So those two categories of data create a really powerful um, source of information to create the products that would inform policy. <coughs> Excuse me. But it's not just the, a biodiversity information facility is not just the technical component um, in terms of data management and formatting. And you, um, many of the trainees here will learn all about that um, during, the, during the course. But the function of a facility is also to, to coordinate the stakeholder network. So really, SAMBI doesn't actually collect very much data. We work through a managed network of partners. So as mentioned before, we work with a range of data holding institutions um, to format that data and publish it on our system. We then work with a number of research institutions to create a value added process to that data by creating the information products, the maps, the, the assessments, et cetera, et cetera, that are more digestible to end users. And we also help develop expertise in this area. So for example, we have a dedicated foundational biodiversity information program um, that capacitates postgraduate students to develop um, content expertise and also generates primary biodiversity data that are needed for policy. Once these products are developed, we then push them out into the relevant end users um, to help with their decision making. So really the role of a biodiversity information facility, and I'm just gonna say facility for short from now on, is to operate at that science policy interface. So we help to identify what the users need, what our governments need to answer. We then provide incentives for a number of different stakeholders. Uh, we develop the relevant capacity, and then we are able to package and visualize that data in ways that can actually lead to positive impact. And again, one of the, this network part is really key, and it's not something um, that people often think about. Really, so much can happen if you convene stakeholders like what we're doing here and just have a conversation and make each other aware of what's going on, what's happening. Um, so SAMBI has hosted an annual biodiversity information management forum since 2008. That's 10 years worth of stakeholder convening. And really, we've moved from um, a kind of once-off transactional type of relationship with many institutions all the way up to long-term strategic partnerships and it really helps to link stakeholders in a functional network and helps to develop social capital and trust. And really at the end of the day, all of this work comes down to the individuals and um, the cooperation that we as institutions show. So as Marshall mentioned, the BIMF is really a key mechanism to being able to, to launch these initiatives. So all of that means that um, SAMBI is able to work across the science policy interface. So we start with foundational data, we enhance the quality, we format it, we make those data sets what we call interoperable with one another so that they can be integrated into information products. We then work with um, scientists, experts, to analyze and process that data. We develop decision support tools, and I'll, I'll go through what we mean by decision support to not, tool now. And then that enables policy support. Um, so it enables policymakers to evaluate the effectiveness of what they're doing. And hopefully that will then feed back 
into what priority data sets need to be collected and where. So this is a kind of virtuous feedback cycle um, across that science policy, um, data science policy value chain. Right, so I hope I've given you a kind of broad, slightly rushed overview of, of what we mean by a biodiversity information facility. And now I want to I, I give you three examples of how this has really helped South Africa to mainstream data into the sustainable development agenda. So as we all know, um, many, most of our agricultural activities and economic activities more generally rely on healthy functioning rivers and wetlands to, to um, provide water. But alien invasive uh, species seriously undermine this productivity. So in South Africa, we've estimated that alien invasive species reduce our water flow by 2.4 billion cubic meters per year. I think that's roughly 5% of our total runoff. And that's estimated to cost us at least $6.6 .6 billion in lost ecosystem services. Those are huge numbers. So in response, our Department of Environmental Affairs launched a public works pro program called Working for Water, where they employ um, people from poor communities to go and clear alien invasive species from watersheds. They spend about 1.7 billion rand on this program per year. And SAMBI helped to inform um, this program by mapping the density of alien invasive species across the country, which then enabled the Working for Water program to place their project sites, and there's over 300 across the country. So all of that's really great. Um, and uh, in, to date, we've employed over 20,000 people with a future goal of at least 120,000 from poor communities. We've cleared 2.5 million hectares of alien invasive species. But a recent study in 2012 highlighted that the scale of the problem is so immense that that investment by DEA risked being inefficient. And this is where it comes back to sustainable development and investment and being good with our money. So what Sambi did was help um, identify priority areas um, for which governments can invest in ecosystem restoration. So we combined our national data layers on wetlands, rivers, and catchments, um, along with their condition, and came up with what we called a national water ecological infrastructure map. So, and that's an integrated layer where the higher values um, indicate greater, higher water production of higher quality uh, and greater flow regulation. So all the good ecosystem services. This then enabled us to um, combine that data layer with socioeconomic data on demand for water. So where is it most needed by urban centers? Where is it most likely to um, generate the greatest socioeconomic impact? And we then came up with 22 what we call strategic water source areas that are directly linked to municipalities and urban centers. Um, and really, this, this process has been so illuminating for us because we co-produced these data layers with the Department of Environment, with our Depo Department of Water and Sanitation. And by combining those two data layers, the environment and the socioeconomic, we were able to come up with some high level stats such as 8% of our land contributes to 50% 50, 50 of our runoff, which supports at least 51% of our population and 64% of our economy. Those are really critical numbers. What it then did, we were able to pull out certain catchments that support disproportionate amount of people and communities to invest the restoration efforts in. So this is leading to a focused investment in um, water production. And a recent study um, that was scoping the, the investment baseline for these two catchments, the Umgeni and the Bavianskloof, estimated that restoring these two catchments alone would increase water supply by 50 million cubic meters per year. Importantly, it would also increase the base flow, which is the, the dry season supply, um, which of course the equivalent in built infrastructure, dams, would not because they rely on obviously rainwater. They also calculated the unit cost per meter cubed of water um, generated. And what we found was that restoration cost about 2 round 50 per, per um, meter cubed, which is comparable to built infrastructure. Uh, dams cost about 0.7 but way cheaper than other things like desalination and wastewater um, recycling. And importantly, so you can see it, it's at least comparable to built infrastructure. And this um, unit cost also do not include the other ecosystem services that restoration provides, such as reducing sediment flow, um, sedimentation in dams, 
and uh, flood abatement, et cetera, et cetera. So the real unit cost is likely to be even lower than dam construction. So this is really critical evidence that um, having a biodiversity information facility has enabled to provide policy advice to government on where to put their investments. Of course, we can also use biodiversity data because monitoring the effectiveness of clearing alien invasives can be really costly. So um, using bioindicators such as dragonflies and damselflies to assess the effectiveness of ecosystem or to, se to assess whether ecosystem functioning has been improved is also a critical component of a facility. And this links to um, the Center of Excellence's plans to build a freshwater biodiversity information system. So recently, some colleagues at Sambi and the Freshwater Research Center um, established that in cleared, in cleared sites, um, odonite diversity was increased, uh, I think it was like double, and critically the threshold was a, at least 40% of alien vegetation had to be cleared to enhance that ecosystem functioning. And of course, these data then feed back in our into our facility, which then enables environmental affairs to monitor their effectiveness and to adapt the work working forward program um, appropriately. Okay, so that's the first example. The second example is um, we can use our biodiversity data, obviously, to assess extinction risk um, uh, through red list assessments, which is a, a key CBD requirement. So this is a map of our uh, data density for all of our mammal species. We've got, I think, just about half a million records. That enabled us to do a national red list assessment of all our mammals. And this is quite close to my heart because I edited it, so yeah, I hope you like the cover. Then um, we were able to assess the extinction risk of all of our mammals to prioritize which species to protect. But that also enabled us to inform sustainable use and trade of our species. So I'm not sure if you're aware, but South Africa has a thriving wildlife ranching industry. The wildlife ranching estate, and when I talk about wildlife ranching, it's hunting, it's game sales, etc., etc. That estate um, is almost double our protected area estate. So this land use is critical for us in South Africa. So we were able to use these red list assessments to come up with a kind of um, risk assessment for whether trade is likely to impact those species which then directly informs something called the Threatened or Protected Species List, the Department of Environmental Affairs, which regulates domestic trade. And that, in turn, through the scientific authority, regulates international trade through, through the CITES appendices. An example of how this has worked to unlock our wildlife economy is through the Cape Mountain zebra, which is a South African endemic species. Because we have the data on population trends, we're able to mo model population growth over time. In 2004, the species was listed as vulnerable because uh, the population was fairly low. But in 2016, due to efforts by private landowners, this population radically increased, which enabled it to be downlisted to least concern. That, plus a tool that we developed to manage, to monitor the sustainable management of those populations on a property scale, enabled us to downlist that species from Appendix 1 to Appendix 2 at the CITES COP in 2017, which unlocked value for private landowners to be able to hunt and trade these animals and increased, almost doubled the value of those animals on private land. So that's another way that biodiversity data can ultimately help to unlock rural economies and um, ecosystem-based adaptation. Now the last, um, the last example that I'd like to talk to you about is something that is pervasive throughout Africa. As we all are aware, the scale of our development is happening at such a rapid pace that we risk those developments undermining biodiversity and eroding natural capital. This is an example from South Africa where we had a site near Port Elizabeth where we had, I think, 12 spe uh, threatened species in these sites here. This site was mooted for development for a shopping center. Um, so the EIA consultants came in. This was before the EIA assessment, um, uh, and this was after the EIA assessment. So they built the um, shopping center right over that population which destroyed it because they didn't have access to the data and because the EIA consultant obviously missed those species. So that's just an example of how if we don't make our data accessible, it can really undermine our biodiversity. <coughs> so to um, mitigate this, we, we have created a one-stop shop layer for our biodiversity data called critical biodiversity areas. This combines all of our species and ecosystem data into, into, a, into a spatial um, layer. It incorporates biodiversity targets, so it's easy to offset um, development projects. 
the simple understanding and the simple schema allow it to be applicable across uh, sectors for mainstreaming. And it creates almost a brand for biodiversity information in South Africa because of the way it's formatted and because it comes from one authoritative institution through which all the data flow. So this data layer feeds into um, our Department of Environmental Affairs screening tool, National Environment Screening Tool, which is a really great tool that um, EIA consultants log on to to assess, to generate baseline reports of the impact of their developments. So for example, they select the kind of development that they're doing. Um, the tool then allows them to upload their, their site of interest, either through a KML or by our cadastral layer. It then auto-generates the potential sensitivities, um, not only for biodiversity data, it's agricultural, it's heritage, et cetera, et cetera. All data layers are in integrated into this tool. And here you can see that for this particular development, I think it's a pipeline, it's quite, it overlaps with um, quite a bit of our highly sensitive aquatic biodiversity. So this tool really helps us. And it's also a very simple category, so if the sensitivity is very high, that site is completely irreplaceable. If it's high, it's unsuitable for development, so it's highly discouraged. If it's medium, it might be important, so it really triggers the need for a survey. And if it's low, no problem. So the importance of this tool is it helps to standardize the EIA quality by producing baseline reports. And because it's gazetted, the consultants have to use this tool. Okay? And of course, it also saves um, dear time and efforts by uh, standardizing the assessments, the baseline assess assessments, and ensuring that they don't have to vet all of the assessments. And the important thing for SAMBI is that we continually update our biodiversity layers for this tool. So kind of, um, we've been able to create a community of practice for these layers, which enhances capacity. And it also ensures that there's continual demand pull for this information because there's a direct application for it. And that's really the kind of final point that I want to make about these examples is that access creates demand. So if you make your layers um, accessible, especially if they've been co-produced by that decision making, um, it really can be quite radically mainstreamed. I just wanted to share with you this, even though I said that the EIA consultants are gazetted to use that tool, many other private firms, this is a private um, urban design firm, uh, and when they're designing their, their town planning um, maps and whatever, they voluntarily use our critical biodiversity areas. So that's just an example of how um, successful um, integrating data into this kind of process can be. Right, um, but of course, so this is all examples from South Africa, and I hope you can see how, how effective making our biodiversity data can be for the sustainable development agenda. But we're stronger together, and really um, what we want to do is create a continental community of practice for this kind of work, a series of interconnected um, facilities or science policy hubs, whatever you want to call it, so that we can better um, standardize our data sets and better cooperate on um, assessments like the IPPs. And hopefully that will lead to better decision making for the continent as a whole. And this precedent has already been set for, uh, um, particularly for Sambi, for South Africa and Rwanda. Our ministers were able to sign a, an environmental cooperation agreement, I think in 2017, with a specific focus on scientific and technical capacity. So that alone has, um, has given the potential for deep partnerships between our two countries to, to emerge. And it's a great example of South-South cooperation. Rwanda is ripe for this kind of work. Um, your economy is focused on ICT development. Um, you, even in your NBSAP, you've mentioned the need for a central biodiversity information hub. And a uh, center of excellence has been mooted to be that hub. And through um, previous efforts, as mentioned before, uh, the Center of Excellence has been able to publish the Rwanda's first national data set um, through help from ARCOS and RIMA. So yeah, I think that's all I wanted to say. Um, and the key message that I wanted to bring home is that we're all in this together. And the more that we can stay connected to one another and help each other um, learn from these kind of things, I think the better it will be for everyone. So thank you very much for, for listening.